At the time that uh, Sir Keir Starmer as the new UK Prime Minister is hosting this summit of the European political community in Blenheim Palace, the birthplace of Winston Churchill, 44 different heads of states from across Europe all getting together to discuss the big issues affecting the continent from migration to, of course, security in the ongoing war in Ukraine. Guest of honour Volodymyr Zelensky is there and he has already addressed the opening of the European Political Community Summit, sitting next door to Sakir Starmer, of course, no doubt discussing the sort of tools his father made. Um, the Ukrainian president said, we've maintained unity in Europe and we're acting together, which means that Putin has missed his primary target. He has failed to create division in Europe. The more decisive Europe is in preserving this unity, the longer lasting peace we will ensure. Well, before the break, um, we were having an interesting conversation about Germany in all of this, weren't we? And uh, the German guilt, really, when it comes to Russia and perhaps Ukraine and Germany's unique relationship in Europe when it comes to Russia mm -hmm. and we saw this play out particularly uh, just after the invasion of Ukraine where Germany were very lily livid about sanctions uh, they were in discussions with Russia about building Nord Stream 2 a second mm -hmm. big pipeline of Russian gas to power their manufacturing and indeed actually when you look at the German economy it's probably taken the biggest hit of all European nations following the invasion of Ukraine but even now, Olaf Scholz cutting uh, his aid to Ukraine in half. Um, I mean, I think for a long time, Germany has been the elephant in the room when it yeah. comes to geopolitics. Very, very much so. And you know, I agree with everything that Cormac said. He always talks a lot of sense with this. Germany has been... Um, under an element of, uh, and I'm going to use the control word, an element of control of um, Russia because of a um, its past with Germany having been split um, uh, during the Cold War, but also German national guilt from the Second World War and you know the, 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 their guilt over um, the, the German regime attacking uh, Russia and the Russians don't let them forget the number of casualties that mm. they suffered and um, the, the way they almost tried to destroy uh, Russia. And do you think it was a very deliberate? choice of language then by the Kremlin when they said that their special operation, their special military operation into Ukraine was the denazification of, of the they, country. They knew exactly what that phrase would mean. They knew exactly how it would send a message into um, the heart of government in Germany and, and across Europe. It would send rip ripples across Europe, as it did. Um, and your know, people coming out horrified by it, but then trying to tiptoe around it from a PC perspective instead of taking it on front and centre and, and deal with it. The, the Russians are very, very good at this. I would love to be a fly on the wall at this summit and hear the sort of conversations taking place uh, about these key issues of uh, uh, giving aid and uh, military resources to Ukraine and at the same time the, the twin issue really, which in, in some respects are kind of interrelated, which is the migration crisis. As we've already discussed, Russia tends to use this and feed it in part as part of their grey zone warfare to destabilise the West. We are seeing uh, coachloads of migrants rattling the border fences between Belarus and Poland, as we've seen already, and it's happening again now, making makeshift weapons, uh, something not often reported here in the UK. The thing is with these summits is you never really do get to find out yeah. what's discussed behind closed doors. There is protocol, there will be a set piece of what we decide we want to say in public. Um, how different is that gap? do you think, between what the leaders discuss and how much they do recognise uh, the reality of the situation and then what the public gets to hear, which is sort of platitudes where you start thinking, do the people in government actually get it? Well, it, it's, it's massive and I think there's, there's something else that's happening here. The governments of Europe are beginning to realise that actually they didn't understand what position they were in the first place. And I'll, I'll take this from a military perspective. You know, the, the reason why there hasn't been you know, oodles of uh, ammunition and artillery shells and rockets fired to U Ukraine for them to use against the Russians is because the stocks that our European leaders, and I include the UK as part of this, thought that there were there because their ministries of defence had said, we've spent these billions of euros or billions of pounds in getting all this done and we're ready to do all of this. They thought, we're ready means that we can do anything. They suddenly realised they can't. It's a paper tiger. It's, it's veneer thin. And that's why they're having to build up their defence industrial bases very fast mm. to try and meet the demand without admitting it publicly. Right. And no surprise, of course, that uh, one of the big issues now spreading around on social media, one of the latest topics that these nutters with their funny hairstyles 
Gaza campaigning against is uh, giving weapons. They're using it under the guise of uh, uh, sending weapons to Israel, of course, using that as the sort of flashpoint to try and garner moral support, we... but probably has a far deeper origin in terms oh, of, very well, so. it's, it would help, actually, if uh, the, the, the military-industrial complex of Britain is suddenly pushed back into a corner. And interesting, listening to David Lammy this morning, talking about he has uh, asked for a report to be drawn up evidencing whether or not we should be sending uh, weapons to Ukraine. Now, I'm hoping that in that report he has to come out and try and sell the arguments that the U United Kingdom will continue to do that because it does seem to me that they are at risk of falling into a bit of a trap. Yeah. We, we, we don't send weapons to Israel. <laughs> we, we, we sell components that go into other devices that are used in a military environment and, and you know, components for the F-35 fighters that Israel uses and all the rest of it. And when it comes to we weapons to Ukraine, we have to recognise that whenever the government donates weapons to Ukraine, weapons tend to be manufactured in the UK. That's creating UK jobs. That's um, creating mm. uh, jobs in defence industries, but also support industries um, that are around there as well. That's paying more money in the UK taxes. That's allowing us to invest more in our NHS, in our hospitals and everything else. It's a good thing yeah. from, a, from an economic perspective. It's the selling weapons... Every person who's military or ex-military would love there never to be a weapon mm. ever needed again anywhere in the world because mm. we're all pacifists at heart. But we fight for peace. Yeah. We don't Power protest through for peace. Might. Peace through